Hello, everyone. Welcome back from your lunch. Um, so in this room, we all believe that we are working towards a better world uh, with more privacy. The motto of this conference, as Fabrice said, shaping the future of privacy. My observation is that because we all believe in what we do, we are no longer really questioning if we are doing the right things. And this may actually limit our possibilities to successfully shape the future of privacy. Because whatever system you choose, there will always be weaknesses to be critically reflected upon. And let's think back of ourselves. When was the last time you sat down just to reflect, is what we are doing the right thing? Um, so in this panel, I will try to do in a very short time an attempt to discuss some potential weaknesses of our system that are often raised by critics of my work. So I am trying to use the opportunity to get fresh perspectives on thoughts that I struggle with myself when I think about the future of technology and the future of privacy. To do so, uh, I welcome my awesome panelist, Renata Franz. Uh, you haven't met Franz yet, but he's from Fairphone, the tech lead of Fairphone. Uh, they make a very nice, ethical smartphone that I coincidentally use myself. Um, and I also welcome Gael, which you have already met from eFoundation. Uh, my Fairphone runs eFoundation, so mm -hmm. friends here. And Renata, I have watched so many interviews with you. <laughs> So I have a lot of questions. Okay. <laughs> so if we wonder, are we doing the right thing? In this room, obviously, the first question should be, should we be doing code in the first place? Because, Renata, I sometimes wonder who has more power, policymakers or open source software? Because I see that Nextcloud is sometimes encouraged, but also limited by existing policies. And I wonder, should all these passionate people go into politics? What's your opinion? Um, I think that uh, neither nor, and that's the problem. I think that uh, we have a big uh, problem before that, uh, which is who's funding the po political parties and who's f and where is the where where are the resources allocated to the for the free software projects? You know, like and and so I think that I think that uh, in, in a way, you know, like it, it is not making the people knowing code uh, uh, get in, becoming the next politician. I think that uh, it, that's a potential approach, but it's not the ideal approach. I think that we need to become more aware of what is behind politics and what is missing from building more resilient um, uh, uh, free software projects. And I think that it is a, a, there's a lot of money in politics. One of the one of the uh, watchdogs in the European Union found that you know Microsoft is the biggest mm -hmm. yeah. lobby company in Europe. You know, <laughs> yeah, like yeah, and, yeah. and then and then you see where the agenda of politicians go because you know who's funding politics. So we should all get rich and then invest in politics. <laughs> Shall we fix the system of, of how political parties are funded? And we can also fix capitalism. <laughs> um, Gael, how do you see this in practice? Is the potential of the Murena project currently limited or encouraged by politics? And have you sometimes wondered about going into politics instead? It's on, I think. Um, going into politics and uh, naturally it depends what you call politics uh, I mean uh, um, everything that we are doing every day is kind of politics actually and the choice we do uh, the value we have or we want to share um, so what, what was the first uh, part of the question how do you see this in practice is Murena encouraged or limited by policies um, it's it's changing. I think there is uh, some hope, uh, and we need hope all the time. But I see that today there is um, um, all those topics about uh, you know um, privacy, but not only. It's uh, about strategic independence. It's about values, ethical values, uh, these kind of things. And what we see today, um, I think. 
at least in our Western countries, is that more and more people care about their impact and what they are doing. Um, there are more and more people who would prefer to, to use an electric car, maybe. Um, we see that Fairphone has a huge success because it cares about how uh, the, the, the hardware is built. Um, and uh, we, of course, know about the climate change and uh, the problem with um, uh, carbon impact, energy, etc. And I think that there is a growing um, awareness. awareness about all those things. Um, and in, in, in the general public. Uh, so I think that uh, we are encouraged by these trends today uh, because there are more and more people who would like to have uh, something better in their pocket, you know, their smartphone. <laughs> uh, something that wouldn't leak all their personal data all the time, something that would have less impact in terms of uh, um, network activity yeah, and yeah, yeah. energy and so on. And, and um, yeah. Okay, so uh, don't become a policy maker, don't become an open source person, let's fix the systems instead. Um, Renata, it's always super fascinating to discover uh, privacy news and privacy perspectives. As I said, I read many of your interviews and in one of your interviews with not only tech, you stated that we need a global ban on surveillance technologies at all levels, both commercial surveillance and governmental enforcement agencies. However, in another interview with Stanford University, I noticed you were advocating for developing AI and using AI to massively correct societal problems. So the following questions occurred to me immediately. Isn't it a problem exactly that we reduce societal problems to algorithms, maths, logic, automation, data in massive spreadsheets while well, these problems are about people? I think that uh, it is the, the problem goes back to the talk that I had earlier, is how we design the technology. I think that we fix the design of it and we make it participatory, multidisciplinary, and so on. If, if I look at a specific example, you know, we could be like monitoring in real time what is going on in the Maya uh, biosphere and in the Amazon to prevent their, like, you know, destruction. When it is destroyed, it's no way back. Um, for some problems, you really need the sophisticated, real-time information uh, together with, uh, to, like, yeah, for example, uh, for, for example, uh, the destruction of the biospheres uh, in in Latin America. Sometimes technology can really technology designed with purpose, with principles, and designed. Uh, for it can really, I mean, I'm not anti-technology, and I know that it has the potential to scale and prevent uh, the situation from getting worse. It's not a magic solution, and it has to be combined with policies on the ground, of course, and people who know the local, uh, the local realities inputting into it. But um, that's uh, different, like, you know, we need <laughs> like the surveillance, maybe like the sensors, shouldn't be on the people, shouldn't be in this, you know, like uh, in these situations that are going on where like, you know, like uh, is, uh, we need speed and coverage at a level that all humans only would not be able to deploy permanently, you know, 24 hours a day measuring like, you know, changes in water, changes in patterns of, of uh, vegetation. I mean, I'm not an environmental expert, but I have talked talk, uh, talk to some that are confident in a combination of policies on the ground and technologies to accelerate certain issues. Certain Another problems. example is uh, on uh, distribution of benefits or identifying, for example, we are doing with, and that's very grassroots, we are doing with our Nepalese colleagues, something trying to cross-reference uh, using, like, you know, citizen technology, citizen uh, deployed technologies to measure the quality of air in Kathmandu and map it and cross-reference cross it with the public health data of people dying from, you know, respiratory diseases. That's the kind of surveillance we need, you know, like we need to surveil 
the air or the or the like you know elements in the environment instead of surveil movements of people and you know like patterns of behavior and so on. So some of the examples of an AI uh, genuinely solving a societal problem could be distribution of resources or health or environmental issues. I think that we can translate many of the you know like uh, Paris Agreement commitments in a well-designed sustainable technologies. It doesn't need to be AI. Uh, that can be uh, that are efficient at scale and efficient at results and are shaped locally. Okay. But good. I mean, we cannot uh, we cannot ignore the fact that we have limited capacities, but mm -hmm. some technologies deployed can in increase our ability to do something. So, what's your opinion then that most of these technologies require massive computational and energy resources? So, if we try to solve climate change through AI, we might be causing climate change. At the I same. think that we need to fix that massive consumption. On, I think that is part of the design process. There's not only one way to do things. And, and um, for example, we have been exploring at the Open Knowledge Foundation a lot of experiments with small data. That are like you know, like that it needs. It can be like you know, technologies, specific technologies that de deploy to analyze a specific situation that lead to good results. It not everything has to be big and massive and massively consuming. Mm, smaller. Yeah, it can be like you can be designed a scale locally deployed and based on clean energies. Yeah, uh, that's the, is the the problem that we have is that the design of those technologies didn't consider sustainability in the first place. Yeah, they just ignore it. So in my academic research, which I do next to, next to my next cloud job, if I still have the energy, it doesn't happen all the time, but sometimes, um, I state that the most effective way to preserve pri privacy is to follow strict data minimization standards. So I advocate for not collecting any personal data, and if you do, to only collect the bare minimum and to delete it nearly immediately. And the reviewers that are critical of my work critique that I throw away the baby with the bathwater, with which they mean that um, if no data is collected, no AI can be developed, and they say that I'm killing the opportunities of AI before AI had the chance to mature and show its true potential. Counter-arguing, I always say, well, it's causing more problems than it's solving right now, like discrimination, bias, etc. But Kael, I'm curious about your perspective on this because let's take this as a thought experiment because your organization's product is effectively limiting surveillance on citizens. Imagine that in 10 years from now and everybody is using a phone with your operating system at Nextcloud, obviously, will happen, certainly. Um, a public debate arises that because everyone is using privacy-friendly non-surveillance technologies, uh, we have effectively prevented the possibility of developing an AI that can solve climate change. Can you imagine this scenario happening? Have you ever thought of this? Um, this I think this is a very interesting question uh, that makes me think about uh, uh, big data and AI. Um, because the, um, what we hear for years is that uh, if you want to do interesting things with AI, you have to collect a massive, a huge amount of data. Yeah. And it justified, it, it helps justify everything that we see today with a personal data collection, etc., etc. But to me, it's just a sign that AI is not effective enough. It's just that it's not working well. <laughs> because if you take a very simple example, um, I have children, and uh, I know how to train on AI uh, to recognize some letters. You have to make it read uh, 100,000 um, types of the A letter, B letter, and C letter, just to have it learn that this is a, a letter, B letter, C letter. But my children, when they learn, uh, you know, the letters, they just see once, twice, and they know that <laughs> it's an A, it's a B, it's a C. They don't have to see this 100,000 times. So uh, I think that uh, um, the thing is, AI has to make progress first uh, to use um, um, smaller. A set of data to train themselves, so there are some progress to do, and, um, and that's it. <laughs> 
Let's go to you, Frans. Um, so Fairphone has very moral ambitions, but there must be moments also in your organization where either technological, economic, or moral compromises have to be made. Could you share with us a story when you struggled because technological progress at Fairphone triumphed over ethics and moral compromises had to be made? Um, huh. Uh there, is certainly, there certainly are these situations, definitely. I mean, we are constrained. We are constrained by, by priorities that we take ourselves, that we decide on ourselves. Um, and obviously, we, um, we are constrained by, by the money that we make. So the revenue that comes in, uh, we, we can't just throw out the money uh, with the bucket. <laughs> um, so, and um, I earlier talked to, uh, to an attendant here about... Um, a yeah, compromise of our of our own values, maybe, um, because we want to make phones last as long as possible, and and we were not always able to provide the means to the users to make this happen, um, and that is, um, so the example was that we sell these modules, and the modules are used for a spare parts to repair a broken module in a phone. So the existing phone does need to be thrown out, but only a very small part of it can be replaced. And thus, uh, saving resources and uh, and yeah, the environmental impact uh, of the phone. But that's not my question. And that is, <laughs> and, and that didn't always work. And that didn't work um, because of, um, yeah, two different constraints I would say. And one is the monetary constraint. We didn't have the resources in a monetary way to to buy the spare parts to provide our um, our users with the spare parts necessary to actually make the thing that we want them to do happen. To use the phone for as long as possible. And the second one is a systemic um, a limitation as well. That, um, that we, yeah, the spare parts might not even be there. The, the product that we use, the component that we use might be discontinued. And um, so yes, we have to compromise on our own values for very different ways and that's, yeah. Franz, you are also a great fan of open source. Uh, but as far as I know, Fairphone, okay, open source would probably apply mostly to Fairphone in its hardware. Open source hardware is apparently also a thing. Um, but Fairphone is not open source hardware. Can you tell uh, a bit more why Fairphone didn't choose for an open source hardware strategy? So with open source hardware, you mean um, that we share specifications, that we share um, the... Um, the cut drawings, uh, whatever, um, or the, the, the specs for our, for our um, uh, components. Yes, um, so why don't we do that all the time? Um, we, um, it is really, maybe it is exactly the, the question you were asking for earlier. So we, um, there is um, priorities that we, that we have and, um, and we don't always align on the same priorities um, that, that could really further the, the agenda that, that, uh, that we have because we need to maybe look at a different angle um, for the time being. And, um, and we try to be as open as possible with what we provide and we try to, uh, to facilitate and enable our users to repair the phones themselves. And, um, and I totally agree. It would probably be even better if we said that we also enable the repair shops um, or maybe different, uh, a different manufacturer to produce an alternative that, that fits um, into, our, uh, into our phones and can be used with them. We did do that once with Fairphone 2. So they used for, to be, for instance, um, external connectors that you could uh, connect peripherals to, not mm -hmm. just a USB connector, but we also had um, behind the back cover, uh, essentially USB, yeah. um, uh, different kind of these examples, which um, the community in our own forum did pick up enthusiastically, mm -hmm. and they played with oh. it. So but, do you um, think... But it wasn't... Can I... Yeah, I quickly want to please. ask a follow-up question on that. No yeah, okay, then please go ahead. Do you think the potential for open source for hardware company is then the same as for a software company like Nextcloud? Because we also have a community who can pick up these type of projects and we benefit massively from that. Yes, so I think the, the benefit really stems from... from a healthy community, right? There's only a benefit to it if there is people who actually pick up on these uh, opportunities and, and who actually uh, utilize the resources that you give them. And, um, and that was what I just wanna, I want to follow up there is what didn't happen with Fairphone 2. 
Um, so there was some uh, individuals who were enthusiastic about it and, and, and played with it and made amazing mm -hmm. projects with it, but there wasn't really an ecosystem um, building around it. Also because we didn't have the time and resources to, to, to actually build it, but um, it didn't happen. And that kind of a little bit burned um, this topic internally. So that's why we don't focus on this so much anymore because there's so many things we want to fix and we want to work on. And this is kind of, yeah, now uh, not so en vogue anymore. Yeah, yeah I, priorities come and go. Um, Gael, will the hardware of the Morena phone be open source? You were planning, I saw in your presentation that you are going to provide a phone, a Morena phone. Yes, the, the new Morena phone, is our, is, it's our own hardware that, hardware that we have introduced uh, this year. Uh, the thing is that we have not designed it from scratch. Uh, it's, uh, we bought a reference design and uh, we cannot, we don't open have the opportunity then. to make it open source, but I agree that it would be uh, very beneficial for everyone. And if we have the opportunity to do this, eventually we will do. Uh, I can see that uh, if you take the example of the Raspberry Pi, uh, it's a hugely successful project. And uh, that, that uh, um, you know, building an ecosystem uh, around this kind of open hardware is really something that is beneficial to everyone. And that can um, trigger some new projects that we wouldn't have imagined at the beginning, so uh, I'm, I'm really supporting this idea of uh, open hardware, yeah, open source hardware. Sounds promising. Renata, I saw that you were making some notes, so I have the assumption you have something to add. <laughs> I have a provocation. Okay, I think ahead. that I will be lynched by the co-panelists, and so I'm ready to run. I'm already like I did. Go ahead, I like you already. <laughs> <laughs> Do we need mobiles? Uh, actually, you know, I was thinking I'm thinking about the planet and thinking about the future of privacy. Yeah. Do we need a tracking device on our pockets following us everywhere? And it's one per person logic even, you know, like every member, you know, like I remember my, the first computer that we had at home. Yeah. Everybody used it. One computer. I mean, one computer, yeah. entire family, okay, we fought, we were fighting over like, you know, access <laughs> sometimes, you know, like, uh, but there was one computer sitting at home, then we had lives outside, you know, like we could go, if we wanted to go to a, to a place, we will check the map, you know, like before going, and we will exercise our brains to get to the next place, you know, like, uh, and maybe uh, we will see the nature on the way, you know, like it's, uh, and as kids, we were playing in the streets in Guatemala, you know, like we had very fun games, and it was a very different, more connected to the human, and less connected to a screen situation. Yeah. And if we think of, okay, the massive amount of resources that we'll take to give updated phones to everybody the next 20 years, critical years for the future of climate. Can we share our device? Can the device be like, you know, can we go back to the logic of public telephone boxes and go back to anonymity and having just, just you know, to have to carry our numbers. And, you know, like, I don't know. Like, I don't know. I, I'm thinking about that a lot because many of the problems of privacy come from the permanent data collection, one device per person. Yes. Yeah. So I had this uh, thought and provocation and I'm, I'm thinking, like, can we conduct our lives does everybody need a telephone and can we conduct our lives without it? Now, Franz, do you want to reply? <laughs> I don't have to no, prepare. No, 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 uh, I like the provocation. Um, I, I mean, I do agree. I also have fond memories of my childhood. Um, it, I didn't have a smartphone. We had a, um, a computer at home. Um, I played outside, but don't children play outside? I mean, I, so I don't disagree. Let me start with that. I don't disagree. I don't a, at oh. all. I think... Um, um, having these trackers in our pocket is a big problem. What I want to first um, focus on is then, do they need to be trackers? So can we disentangle that maybe? Can we maybe first, like Gael is doing, approach the problem of the device tracking us and then see, um, and, and yeah, and disentangle that question from whether we actually need the, the computing device in our, in our pocket? Because yeah. that's, that's the fundamental broken thing about it for me that other people are exploiting us using this device and not, um, and not only using it for our benefit or for the benefit of, the, of society. And the second question then is, so that, that's I think we should um, ask separately. 
And the second um, then is, do we need these devices at all? And I, um, I think, yeah, I totally agree, and that's also one of the major focuses of Fairphone. We need fewer of these devices to be produced and sold. And one obvious way of doing that is having less of them around, just not buying one for everyone. Like, if, if all of us share 10, maybe, um, and we scale that all over the world, we have fewer devices that need to be produced, fewer exploitation of the resources of the Earth, and, uh, and fewer waste uh, in the end. That would be a, a solution. I don't see how that practically works. That's just so freaking convenient. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I'm attached to my phone uh, as a communication device with my family, for instance. So, um, yeah, um, but, but what we do is making them last longer. So that also tackles the environmental impact that you mentioned earlier. And I think we can work around these things. Um, uh, we can tackle these problems individually. And, um, and then maybe also detox a little bit every now and then, you know? You don't need, if you go out with your friends, maybe you don't need the phone because you can conver converse with them anyway. If you are around your family, I feel so guilty of that. When I sit at home uh, and my child came home from, from, from daycare, I picked her up, and then I sit there with my phone on my hand. Yes, I should not use my phone in this situation, definitely. But that doesn't mean that I, that I shouldn't have the phone at all. I think there's, there's nuance to that. That wasn't really captured by your question, by your provocative <laughs> question. In the end, it's probably a little bit like my grandmother who doesn't want to go off Facebook because she doesn't want to mi miss out on the bingo party. Uh, in the end, we all want to play Flappy Bird. Um, let's move to... <laughs> And let's move to a topic of security. Gael, I tried to find back an interview with you a very long time ago that I remember, but I couldn't find it back, so I hope I don't imagine this question. Um, the interview, I remember it, was that a privacy-friendly phone is not necessarily the same as a secure phone that is suitable for bad people when you have something to hide. So can you explain? So this was a true interview? I didn't picture it. <laughs> yes, uh, um, that's true, yeah. Can you explain a bit more about what type of security concerns could be exploited if a Murena phone would be used by someone who does have something to hide, like an activist? Yes, that, that is a, a real question, and thank you for, for raising this topic, uh, because uh, it's something we, it's a question we are often asked, uh, but uh, why, uh, what, why aren't you um, doing more um, hardening security on your, on your smartphone? Uh, the thing is that uh, if you want um, some privacy on the smartphone, you have to have some good security, but it's just good security. It's not hardened security. Um, it's, it's not very useful, actually, because on the other hand, you can have very hardened, hardened security devices, uh, but with just one purpose. It, it, it will be to, to securely send all your personal data in a safe way to Google, and that, that's what <laughs> they keep on exp explaining all the time. Uh, so so it's, it's, it's two different things, uh, actually. And, the purpose of what we do with, with EOS and Marina smartphones um, is to give um, users and people the opportunity to escape the massive global uh, dat permanent data collection uh, for business purposes uh, from Google and, and, and many other companies. Uh, but Yes, it's true, we are not doing this project for people uh, who could be targeted, uh, like um, you know, people working for uh, governments or activists or criminals, maybe. Uh, we are not do doing this project for them. Uh, we just want to, to, to make a product that, we, that will be um, easy to use, um, attractive uh, for the largest audience, but I mean common people, common usage. And there are other projects for security hardening. Okay, so it's a matter of focus of the project. Sure. Uh, Franz, I think I read that you are also very passionate about security. Uh, but if I think of Fairphone, then I can't really imagine what kind of security concerns you are dealing with. So could you tell us a bit more about the type of security issues you have encountered at Fairphone? So yes, I do care about security, definitely. Um, I think um, our involvement is on a similar level to what Gail just uh, explained. So we really want to have a, um, a secure system for the everyday user. So we sell uh, a phone that, that we want to sell to as many people as possible um, and to, to 
yeah, to, to make them useless for as long as possible. And that means making these phones also um, secure on an everyday, day-to-day -day level. It doesn't need to be, like we also don't address, um, again, I had this nice conversation with the attendee, thank you, Jonas, <laughs> uh, um, about activists uh, who, who might complain about lack of, um, of, uh, of hardening of our phone. And, um, and that is not who we cater to. That's not the threat model that we envision. That's not the focus we have. Um, the, the security that, um, the, the level of security that we deal with is really fixing these known um, uh, vulnerabilities in, in the operating system and in the firmware and applying those patches. We don't do the research ourselves to find these. That's the, the job of other people. And um, yeah. Renata. Are you, after hearing all of the security concerns, comfortable to use these devices or software? Um, I'm pretty, like you know, like yeah, I'm, I'm pretty more confident, and I don't, I don't want to, you know, to sound like an infomercial, <laughs> please. But it is different. I mean, I'm, I'm good for like you know options, uh, decentralization, and knowing who's building the technology I'm using. So it's kind of reassuring to be like, you know, sitting next to real humans, <laughs> not, you know, like not, not, ego, no, not egomaniacs who are like, trying to fly out of the planet. Uh, as, as, the, <laughs> as, as, you know, like as, as the people building our technology. And it's, it goes back to what I was trying to say at uh, the keynote. I think that that's... You know, if if it's not working, I know where their offices are. You know, like and I can I know them. You know, like and and, uh, and I can I can engage in a dialogue uh, or uh, organize my consumer association in my in my locality, or I can, you know, get a group of users together. And it's not, you know, like uh, when, when the actor on the other side is a giant. Uh, your voice is not heard because they're up in the sky, like you know, with the head in the clouds. And they only hear to the to big investors and big money up there, and they are like in a, they are in a level up, like higher than even policymakers, than even presidents sometimes. So, bringing the technology down to earth, maybe they, they, they those telephones do not have many of the things that are like uh, convenient or exciting or blah, but I think that the, this closeness. Engaging with providers that are like, you know, like on a human level, an approachable level is far better when we are like trying to exercise rights and we want uh, to have technology that works, it's much better. You know, it's a little bit like when you uh, buy uh, fruits in your local market versus buying GMO fruits in the like massive chain. A little bit like that. I think that it's a, a healthier choice uh, with a closer level of accountability that is still feels human. So when are you going to become a Nextcloud user? No, just kidding. I am a Nextcloud user. <laughs> oh, look so. at that. <laughs> <laughs> and again, again, I know where you live. So. <laughs> <laughs> I have friends high up in the cloud. <laughs> So let's uh, slowly reach to a conclusion. Um, so the last question of me to all of you three is what are important considerations or appeals that you would like to add to today's discussion? Um, Frans, do you want to start? Yes, I, um, thank you. I, uh, the initial question that you had was about, or like your conclusion even to those uh, few questions where um, you need to change the system. And we shouldn't be either politicians nor, um, nor technologists. And I think um, that doesn't really catch it. I think um, we are changing the system to some extent, right? We are, I mean, within the system, but from within the system we are, um, and we don't completely walk out the house, sorry, Renata, <laughs> um, but we are striving to make a difference, to, to change the, in our case, the electronics industry bit by bit. Um, by example, just you know, showing that it's different, that it's possible to do something different, that it's possible to be responsible, and to uh, yeah, and we shouldn't just hide because we because it seems impossible to to change capitalism. So we can change the stuff, and that's what I want to finish on. Maybe Renato, do you want to continue? 
Yeah, going back to like, you know, reimagine the way we communicate and the multi-user experience. And imagine how amazing it would be to bring back the idea of the public phone in the corner, but done, done by technology similar to these ones, to rethink a public device available for everybody, uh, everybody like with anonymous users that you can use passing by, you know, that, that you that you are not conditioned to ownership of one device that is tracking you all the time. And that if you are like you're out of money or you lost your telephone or you are like, you know, like a, in a precarious situation or like in many circumstances that you are not completely disconnected from the digital sphere and this public infrastructure supporting your connectivity. I think that we lack that. We saw it in the COVID crisis, you know, like we lack that infrastructure. We used to have it at least a way to reach the other end, and, and we, we stop having it. It would be amazing to rethink it and with, a, with a free software and open hardware, create a version that will enable people, ena enable us to think about technology, one device used by multiple people in a different way. And Gael, do you want to close? Uh, <clears throat> yes, may maybe uh, I wanted to raise uh, quickly one topic is, um, uh, I, I think the main issue today uh, is probably that, um, you know, all the big techs, um, their purpose is not to do good products, actually. Their purpose is to make money and as much money as they can. And everything is organized for that, that purpose. And uh, in particular, I'm thinking about social networks. Uh, they really know what they are doing to capture everyone's attention all the time the, and the maximum uh, brain time as they can. Uh, for what? Just to sell advertising. And I think this is something that needs to be fixed because um, there are people like you and me who are aware of this, but there is a lot of people, and I'm thinking about uh, young people, children, teenagers, who are not aware of this, and they they are betrayed in some way. Uh, they, they they don't know that all the system is organized to capture their brain time for some business purpose. And I think that for this, the only way to today um, is to improve the regulation. And I'm pretty optimistic because uh, things are changing now, and we see in Europe, in the U.S. Uh, many people uh, are really supporting the fact that we need, we need more regulation. It shouldn't be the Far West anymore for this. So that goes to my initial question, should we be doing code? <laughs> should no, we just be kidding, doing that's code? me. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Thank you very much for your uh, attendance to this panel. And uh, I would like to hand over the microphone back to Fabrice. Thank you.